Perfect. So hello everyone, uh, Ariel, Maxim, um, we're going to talk about VDPA behind me. I do have a tendency to talk too quickly sometimes, so you can just tell me, and then I'll talk quicker. Um, so let's get the agenda. Um, so we're going to start from the problem statement. One of the, pro one of the issues when we talk about VDPA is that it, it is so technical, we touch so many things that you can lose your you know, your eye off the ball, so we just want to start from the problem statement. What are we actually trying to do here? Um, then we're going to talk about SRV based acceleration, for those who are not familiar, a few words on SRV, and how do we actually, actually use it to accelerate containers and VMs. Then we're going to move on to VDPA, kind of like explain what it actually does, and how again it's used for accelerating containers and VMs. Um, then we're going to talk about the VDPA kernel framework briefly. Uh, VDPA DPDK framework, we're going to talk about the VDPA Kubernetes framework, uh, which is currently in development, a live demo, um, looking forward, and Q&A. So the, the problem we're trying to solve here is about uh, accelerating network acceleration for VMs and containers, okay, kind of a, a high level. Um, in today's use case, both uh, telco and enterprise, we're seeing more and more use cases, more and more situations where you actually want to take a VM or container and you want to give it a, a, a fast networking interface. Okay, fast is warp speed, that is off capacity and very low latency. Okay, and the way to do that usually today is with SRV. Um, the point here, when we talk about accelerating, accelerating networking, that also means many things. So we split the discussion to um, uh, packet processing and packet steering. Okay, packet processing is your application that's going to build a packet and make it pretty send it. Packet steering is actually getting the packet from the application as fast as you can into the NIC. Our focus, BDPA, is about packet steering. Okay, packet processing, DPDK, and other tools. Um, but we'll, this is something we're going to talk about a lot. The, the issue of uh, decoupling your VM and container from the physical NIC. Okay, so we're going to say that again and again. The SRV, we'll see in a second, uh, is, is a very good solution. It is deployed today uh, by telcos and others but it, it creates the decoupling between the actual image of your container of VM to the physical NIC and it, it has drawbacks. So talking about SRV, a formal definition is you know, single root virtualization, standard type of PCI device, um, shared by single device with multiple virtual machines. What it actually means is that you can take a physical device and slice it. So you're basically taking and slicing it to uh, multiple containers on VM, they're, they're all sharing the same physical link, although they feel as if each of them has their own uh, physical link, which is really just a slice of VF. When we talk about SRV, we talk about PFs and VFs. PFs, physical functions, VF, virtual functions. VF is, is, is the PCI, uh, PCI device, device basically, it's how you provision the, the physical NIC. It's, it's the NIC actually, you can only have one PF on a physical NIC. But then you have VFs. So VFs are those slices of the PCI. Okay, and you can have multiple VFs on a single physical link. So talking about SRV, uh, how do we actually accelerate with this? And for SRV, we're going to talk about containers who also have acceleration for VMs, but we just want to focus the discussion here. Um, so the dark items we use, and we're going to use it all through the, this talk, is we always have our uh, hardware layer, which is the hardware blocks, we have the kernel space, we have the user space, and then we, did, we map the different building blocks into these dimensions. In Kubernetes, we talk about a node, so this is a node with the user space, kernel space, hardware block, and we're going to describe this top down. So top down, again, we're focusing on packet steering, okay? Packet processing is done by EPDK. So typically, what you're going to see today with this RV, you're going to see a in container case, you're going to see a container with a, a DPK library linked into the application that does a very efficient packet processing, and the packet steering is done by SRV. How is it done by SRV? It's built on Maltus. So Maltus is a CNI that enables you to associate multiple CNIs to a given pod, that is to inject multiple interfaces into the same pod. Why is it useful? Because it's a non-intrusive solution. That is, you can have your regular Kubernetes deployment with yet another container, the primary interface is just a Kubernetes interface, does everything as usual. You can push a secondary interface, or a third or a fifth interface, 
that is accelerated, that is connected to a server, and you can do whatever you want there. So the main building blocks top down are the <coughs> SRV device plugin, which is really the bookkeeping, okay, maintaining all the VFs, which the device plugin manager uses. We've got the Maltus connected to the CNI. We've got the SRV CNI, uh, which is comes in through the Maltus. Um, it talks both with the actual pod, it injects uh, an interface net zero SRV, and it also talks with the physical NIC SR, SRV, basically, um, for example, provisioning a VM or configuring something up. A Mac or a VLAN for that VF. Inside the pod itself, we have the vendor VF PMV, which is a PMV Colomore driver, VBDK, I think most of you are familiar with that. Uh, it's an efficient way to do packet processing. The, from that point on, the vendor VF PMV can talk directly with the physical NIC. Then we differentiate between the red line, which is the data plane, and the blue line, which is the control plane. So this is actually memory mapping. You push it back so quickly. Control plane, signaling, for example, anything uh, on top of that. The key point of the slide that this part here, the vendor VF PMV, that driver inside, inside that container, is vendor specific. Okay? It is tightly coupled with this specific vendor NIC, vendor firmware. Okay? If you take this container, you try running it on a different node in Kubernetes with a different uh, NIC or, or the same NIC with a different firmware, it's, it's not going to work. So this is how it's done today. Um, and then we jump to VDPAs. So what is, what is VDPA? So the basic concept is to take something that's been around for 12 years or, or yeah. more. Uh, Varia networking, okay, Varia uh, virtualization, okay, the ability to take uh, VMs and run them, run your VM or GIFs over a host. Varia Net is one of those interfaces for networking. We're basically doing, taking the Varia Net and instead of just taking it from the VM or guest to the host, we're pulling it all the way down to the physical net. So VDPA or Varia Data Path Acceleration is composed of two parts, the data plane and control plane. The data plane part is the green web. It's how do I actually arrange the, the buffers? And that's something standard. VDP assumes that the, the, the NIC vendors, the NICs, they implement the VDPA data plane, which can be or slippering or factoring as defined in the various spec maintained by devices. Everything is open and standard. The other part, aside from the data plane, is the control plane. VDPA does not assume that the NIC vendors implement the VDPA control plane inside their NICs. Okay. Instead, it provides a translation layer. It's a framework, or in the kernel, which I will describe, or EPDK, which Maxim will describe, which the vendor can basically push in his drivers. So from this point, he's using his proprietary interface to talk with his physical NICs. But the framework then translates that to something standard, which can be, or uh, basically, uh, can you see that? VOC's protocol or kernel ICTL, ICTL, depending if it's containers or VMs. Um, the point is that if we do this thing, we are able to now have a, an open standard Vertio driver inside your container or image. And we're going to see that in a second. That means that it's decoupled from the actual physical NIC. Uh, I'm just going to point out that there is another way to do this, which is called Vertio full hardware floating. Okay, and this is actually in production in Alibaba, for example. Alibaba bare metal server, where you actually implement in the, on the physical net, NIC both the control plane and data plane. Um, we've, Maxim has actually tried this out for the KubeCon demo we did in, in, uh, in October. Mohan is also here, worked on it. Uh, it's much more challenging because the control plane changes much more rapidly than the data plane. Uh, why is it complicated? So, first of all, many stakeholders, many opinions. And the second topic is, because it touches so many things. So if you think of it, it's something so small. I mean, it's just a VDP. It's just your first interface to move from your Potter container into the NIC. And then there are so many other things that you need to do. But in practice, it's really complicated because you need to touch so many things. You need to work on the kernel, on the QMU, on the liver, on the VDK, on Kubernetes, OpenStack working for it. So it touches many, many communities. Are we in time? Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, so let's see how, how do you actually use VDPA to accelerate containers. So very similar to the picture we use for the SRV. And the main building blocks are, are the same. So we've got uh, our VDPA, VDPA device plugin instead of an SRV device plugin, which is able to do the bookkeeping for VFs in the case of VDPA. We still use Maltus, and Maltus then pushes in a VDPA CNI instead of an SRV CNI. And then we push a net zero VRIO interface into the pod. 
but the magic starts here. So first thing that we do is we have a Vertio net PMD driver. This is a standard uh, Vertio driver. It's not vendor specific. It couldn't care less. Okay, it's generic. And the second thing that we do is we have a framework. Okay, so in this case, I'm showing the framework inside the kernel. It can also be in the user space using VDPK. And this is the VDP inferno plus the VDP at vendor drivers. The, the Nick vendor basically pushes his, his own control plane driver here, and that does the translation. So again, we have a data plane going directly from the NIC, from uh, the driver all the way to the NIC, standard Vertio data plane, and we have our control plane going for a translation there. If we want to look at VMs, for example, so in the world of, <coughs> of VMs, we've got our, uh, you know, we've got Libvirt, we've got KVM, we've got our QMU process. Inside the guest, we have the kernel space and user space. So again, if we're talking about acceleration, we're usually going to talk about DPDK applications. In this case, the DPDK application has its uh, Vertio net PMD in the user space here. And again, it talks directly with the physical NIC, data plane memory mapping going all the way down. It's the same VDPA framework we saw in the case of the containers. So, so the point is, the same framework can support both containers and VMs. So we talked about this block here, the, the VDPA framework in the kernel. So I'm, I'm going to talk shortly about this framework. Maxim is going to talk about the DPDK. Um, for all the native kernel speakers, it's, it's going to be, it's really a high level of short discussion on this because Jason Wong, who's, who's leading this effort, uh, he's basically you know, finished a document about 30 pages on this and you know, the issues of IOMU and DMA and uh, so many variants and how can you support them. Intel and Linux, so it's a much broader discussion. We prefer taking that one offline. So if you zoom in, this is the VDPA firm. In a nutshell, again, hardware, kernel, user space. On the hardware side, when we talk about VDPA, we have we have now and we, we will have in the future multiple uh, VDPA devices for different NEC vendors. I talked already about VDPA, VFs, and PFs. Okay, similar to SRV, you've got your physical functions, you've got your virtual functions. But looking forward, you're going to have additional things. You're going to have sub-functions. Okay, this is something Melmox supports already today. And we're also going to have ADA, ADI, which is um, something device interface. Uh, ADI includes some it includes new technologies such as, as um, scalable IRV, for example. So Intel are coming up with scalable IRV. It's your ability, instead of using slices of VFs, to use much smaller slices. Okay, they're using capacities going all the way down. And that's something that we also want VDPA to support looking for. So VDPA is not only a replacement for SRV, it's a replacement for any uh, interface going um, all the way down to the physical. The key point of the VDPA framework is the ability to take all these different devices, VDPA devices, and expose them to, to the existing today VOS and Vertero driver as, as yet another uh, VOS device or, or Vertero device. And, and that's kind of the key points. I'm just going to say that again. This is what we have today. It's been around for a very long time. Okay, VOS, the Vertero driver, always there. Usually what happens is that VOS, in the typical case, that run, that's what runs on the host. And the host kernel on the Vertio driver is what usually runs on the guest kernel. In the case of VDPA, we, we pull them both to the host. And we want to give them the ability to, to continue doing exactly what they, they did. That is talking with VOS devices or Vertio devices. From practice, they're talking with VDPA devices. So that's what the VDPA framework does. So now I'm just going to zoom into the uh, video framework. VDPA framework. Then I'm going to talk about the VOS path and shortly about the Vertio now, the VOS pass is what we're currently using. All the use cases we talked until this point, container acceleration, VM container acceleration, everything goes through the VOS part. The Vertio path is for more advanced use cases we're planning to get to. I, to get to. I know Telco, Elko talked about AFXDP, which is a, basically a socket-based interface. And we're also looking into socket-based interfaces that will replace in the future the DPDK interface to consume VDPA. So first of all, opening this box. So the key part of the VDPA framework is the VDPA bus. Okay? For each of the different VDPA devices the NIC vendors provide, they also develop uh, a driver. And the driver is, is vendor is vendor specific. 
which is this, okay? Also, the, and again, we're talking about the control plane. In this case, I'm reminding everyone, data plane is scattered. It's just memory mapping. So all the framework is just for the control plane. The interface between the driver and the physical device is proprietary. It's, it's vendor specific. We know that. And you're going to have many of those options. But what this framework does is it forces you to implement an interface inside your driver, which we call a VDBA, VDBA device abstraction, which connects to the VDBA bus. So the way we work with a, with a bus is we have a driver and we have a device, and the bus basically connects them together. So on the one hand, these are drivers, if you look at it from the side of, uh, of the uh, devices here. But from the perspective of the bus, these are also devices. Okay, so that's a little tricky. But, but again, we have this perspective of devices and the perspective of drivers. So after I presented the, the basic opening of the block, now I want to focus on, okay, so how do I actually connect the VOs to this bus? And I do it by adding another block here, which is called the VOs VDP at bus driver. Now, I know the names are also somewhat challenging, um, so I'm, again, just going to try to explain the essence. The essence is that VOS has been here for 10 years, and VOS knows how to, how to work with a VOS device. That's what it knows. And we want to continue using that. We don't want to change anything. The whole idea of VDP is building on something that works, not, not changing the world. So on the one hand, VOS needs to talk with a VOS device. But on the other hand, these are actually VDPA devices. So the essence is that by putting a translation layer here, which is a VOS VDPA bus driver, we're able to give the VOS driver here the impression he's actually talking with a VOS device. But on the other hand, um, from the perspective of, of the, the VDPA bus, um, this is just a driver and not a device. I, I hope I was able, able to, to convey this message. I know that the, the naming is imperfect, but again, takeaway here, VOS is something that's been a long time here. We want to keep on using it. It just sees, sees VOS devices, but in practice, the magic here, it's working with VDPA devices. The other path, path is the VirdIO driver path. Now again, this is traditionally running inside the guest. We're pushing it into the kernel. And again, we're building on existing, ex existing parts of VirdIO, which are the VirdIO driver and the VirdIO bus. But here again, we, we push in this translation block, okay, which we call a VirdIO VDP bus driver. And what it does is, again, it gives the VirdIO driver the impression it's just talking with a VirdIO device. So if you remember, in the case of PMU, for example, so VirdIO would run in the kernels, um, in the guest kernel, and then it would talk with a, with a device which is inside QMU. We're doing something really similar here, okay? but it's just inside the kernel. And again, VirdIO driver talks with a uh, VirdIO device, although in practice it's talking with a VDPA device, and so many different options. So that's kind of the magic of the framework here. To repeat what I said, the VirdIO driver is for future use cases. VHOS is what we're using for everything that we're talking about today. Containers, VMs, everything is, is VHOS. But looking forward, we, we have concepts we call AF VirdIO, okay, which is again the socket-based interfaces, and they're going to be using um, VirdIO driver. Thank you. Thank you. So I have talked about uh, the kernel communication of VDPA, and on my side I will talk about the DPDK1. So first, maybe not everyone is uh, aware of what VDK is. Uh, it stands for uh, Data Plane Development Kit. It is basically um, uh, a framework, a set of user space library and uh, polymer drivers that are used to achieve fast packet processing. Regarding VDK, uh, it has been uh, developed uh, by a joint effort of Gitter and Red Hat and introduced in 1805 release. It, uh, it plays on top of the, uh, the VOS user library of DPDK and uh, rely on the VOS user protocol to, uh, to provide a, a unified interface uh, to, to the, to the front-end. And what is needed also on top of this uh, VDPA framework is VDPA drivers that are also part of DPDK. Uh, to, uh, to handle the, the vendor-specific control path. So before uh, introducing you to, uh, to, the, to VDPA, uh, let's have a look at uh, a classic uh, architecture of virtualization uh, based on uh, OBS DPDK, something that's today on the production. Uh, 
On the gas side, uh, we have the VNF, for example, that is using uh, vertical net PMD. Uh, so this is a standard uh, vertical net driver of DPTK. Uh, it uses a VFIO to, to control uh, the power neutralized vertical net device. And OBS DPTK uses the POS user library to, to, uh, to have an to act as a backend for the for, for the vertical net device, meaning that uh, PCI register accesses that are done uh, on by the vertical net PMD are translated some way uh, into the host user protocol requests. Things like uh, setting uh, setting the varying uh, addresses, uh, configuring the number of queues, etc. So. As I said, uh, obviously DPTK relies on the VOS library for, for, for to act as a VOS user backend. And so the, um, the data pass is processed in software by the VOS user library, which means that uh, it costs a lot of CPU um, and has an impact on performance. Um, OVS uh, will switch uh, the, the packets, so we will have an extra copy here. So the packets will be switched from, uh, from the VOS user lib uh, to OVS by event copy, and uh, it will be switched sorry, to, uh, to a vendor PMD, which is a, uh, a vendor specific driver uh, to control the physical. So advantage of advantage of such a solution is that it gives some flexibility on our side to to, uh, to switch a packet. Uh, it's also, we also have a vendor acoustic driver uh, running in the guest. Unlike a SRIOV solution as uh, Ariel presented, uh, another advantage is that you can, uh, you can support live migration because the VOS user, user library is able to, uh, to do dot page logging to, to know which pages have been modified by the, by the OPS DVDK process. But as I said, we have a lower performance with such a solution and, and it has a lot of impact on, on the cache pressure, cache utilization, and CPU usage. Meaning that uh, compared to a SRI, SRI solution, for example, uh, you, will need, uh, you will have less uh, VA, VNS or CNS, uh, VNS in this case, uh, by machine. So now let's compare with the, the VDPA uh, solution. Yeah, just, just to connect this, so, so before that we described the kernel VDPA framework, and now we're showing the DPDPA framework. Okay, they both provide the same capability. Yeah. And so, um, so as in our slide, uh, we have the same exact same uh, building blocks we got in the VNF. So we have the same VNF using the same driver, same configuration. But instead of having OVS DPDK, we have another process that acts at the VDPA daemon. Which translate, which receives the VOS user protocol request from QNU. And, um, and we use the, 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 the daemon will translate the VOS uh, request into uh, vendor specific uh, hardware register accesses. And here, the data pass is no more than uh, processed in software, it goes directly to the need. So as uh, the, the VOS user solution, uh, the software solution, we are still on the agnostic. We still support live migration, so live migration can be supported uh, either directly in hardware, um, but it has a cost on the PCI bandwidth, or uh, can be uh, assisted by, uh, by, by the demand. But it will have a sub cost on the CPU usage. So compared to the VOS user solution, uh, the software solution we have better performance and much less CPU usage because we have no more extra copies, we have no more uh, processing of the descriptors and software. But compared to uh, what I have presented earlier, we require in this case uh, an application running on the other side uh, to translate the, the, the VOS user protocol into the vendor specific. Accesses. 
So the key point here is that we are still standard. So we use uh, the VLOS user protocol that is specified in QNU, meaning that we can reuse, plug it directly to QNU. We can use it directly with uh, containers using vertical user PNU. We don't have to do any change in the application when we want to move to a solution that is uh, software based for the data assembly to be hardware based. And, um, so, VDP framework to, to achieve that uh, defines a set of products that the uh, vendor drivers will have to implement uh, to, to, to do the translation. Um, basically, we have callbacks to set, get, vertical features, uh, where is the number of queues supported by the need, uh, to configure the IOFB table using uh, the FIO, and to set up uh, the, the hearing uh, addresses. So for now, we only have one application, which is an example in DPDK, that, uh, that can act as a gamer. So we are looking to, uh, to, to integrate it in our solution or to, to, provide, uh, to provide an application uh, that, will be, uh, that, will, that will be okay for, for production. So now let's, uh, let's have a look at uh, how does it fit uh, in a Kubernetes architecture. So we'll see that, uh, so here we have a, a workload that will, uh, that will uh, consume the VDPA VF uh, using a virtual user PNP. So the main thing, so we have uh, three main building blocks. So the first is the VDPA CNI that I introduced. So it is a, a CNI, the CNI is a plugin that is, that is loaded by Meltus at the uh, time. It will be uh, in charge of injecting the VOS user socket to the, to the pod. We have the VDPA daemon set, uh, which uh, will run the DPDK daemon to do the translation between VOS user requests and uh, vendor specific accesses. So this, uh, this daemon set also runs a gRPC server so that the CNI can query uh, for a given say which VOS user socket is. And finally, we have the DPA device plugin daemon set. Uh, this daemon set is used to um, is, uh, act as a bootkeeper. In at start time, it will uh, scan the system, query the system to, to, to get the available VDPA, um, VDPA devices uh, on the system. And um, when we have some network attachment that will be created, uh, it will make the link between the uh, PCI address and the, uh, the custom uh, resource description that will be required by the, by the worker. So when the workload starts, um, we have a CRD, to send a CRD to, uh, to have a CRD that could let will handle. We ask Meltus to, to resolve uh, it, so it would be a, a resource name, for example, HTTP D, if it is an HTTP server. And uh, the device plugin demand set will, um, will, um, will send the PC address that corresponds to such a resource. Meltus will forward the information to the VTP CNI, which will query the gRPC server to, to get the VR um, user socket pass corresponding to this PCI device. And when it gets the information, the socket file is injected into the, the pod, and the workload can, can initiate and uh, initiate the VTP link. So now we'll, uh, we'll do a demo if the Wi Fi works. Uh, so the, the demo is based on uh, is based on what I presented uh, just before. Uh, the workload is an HTTP application which is based on Sistar. Sistar is a, the framework developed by CLDB, uh, which is a database company uh, that that is used for, for achieving for high performance server application. And Sistar uh, we use we selected this uh, framework to support DPD. 
uh, regarding the hardware, we, uh, we use uh, Intel Cascade Clash Shield Smart Mix. Uh, this mix supports Vertigo 1.0 specification, so they don't support yet the pack twin uh, version of the Vertigo spec. So it's on the split frame for now. And currently, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this mix is not available uh, publicly. You can uh, only uh, sell it to, to selected, selected customers. Yeah, so basically we have the same uh, building block that before. So the workload will be CSTAR TTPD and we will connect another server uh, which will also use CSTAR but as a traffic generator. Wi-Fi is still working, so that's good news. Uh, so we have a Grafana dashboard here. Uh, here, <coughs> see some Prometheus metrics. Explore. Oh, no, it's not working. <laughs> I have a backup. I have a backup. So we need a VPN for the Grafana. That's why it's uh, breaking constantly. Here, we have the, the Grafana dashboard. Um, Sistar uh, HTTPD application exports some metrics. So here's the number of uh, HTTP requests per second. Here we have some statistics regarding the, the throughput and number of packets per second uh, on the VDC <coughs> link. And here we have a list of the containers that are running uh, on the node. So, as I said, on this machine, we have the Intel Cascade Vlaché uh, NIC, Smart NIC. Uh, we can see when uh, with LSPCI uh, that it exposes uh, Vertio, uh, Vertio VF. So here we have the PF, the zero, and three VFs are created. These VFs are bound to, uh, to VFIO. Here, onto the, to VFIO, so we can consume it from user space uh, with DPDK, for example. So here we now we start the, the three building blocks, the two building blocks, uh, the demand set and the network attachment definition, and we will start the, the, the HTTP pod. Okay, very interesting. You can see it here. So the demand set, we create the network attachment. So in our case, we only need, only need one. Uh, it will be this one, uh, which corresponds to the HTTPD. Um, the two other one could, uh, for example, be another network attachment for uh, another type of application. So it's done. You now, if you we move back to the graph and dashboard, we see that our containers are up and running. So the sister uh, one is not fully initialized because we don't see the metrics yet. Okay, now it is initialized. And we will move to. Uh, yeah, so we can see that we have the our pods here. Yeah. So I can just point out we, we've got back to back two physical servers. Okay, one server is injecting traffic. The other one we're, we're actually uh, using. So first of all, they both support VDP. The one is just injecting traffic, and the other one we're actually running as a Kubernetes node and uh, getting all these pods out. Yeah. So on the traffic generator side, we just. Uh, Start to generate some traffic using CREC and over Scylla, uh, C star application. And here we can see that the traffic start to, to flow. Well, 
Okay. So, so just to add, so currently it's about 160k up. So it's not a lot of traffic what you're seeing here. Um, but point A, this is real. That is, it's a real VDPA uh, NIC. Okay, data plane all the way through, including a control plane. Again, the framework in this case is a DPDK framework, not a kernel framework. But, but still, I mean, it was important for us also, also to show in, in QCon, uh, in Rad Booth, that uh, it was a real technology. And the second part is that gradually we're, we're improving the, the performance, and again, the, the target is to reach SRV performance. So, uh, what is the packet size? The packet size in this one? Yeah. Well, it's a uh, standard size, uh, it's uh, 1000 and uh, something. But uh, the cost here is mainly on the TCP stack. We have uh, 20 simultaneous connections, but we only use one CPU uh, to, uh, to achieve this traffic on both sides. So we actually wanted to get for something more stable. <coughs> QCOM, for example, it's about getting something simple and stable than really you know, pushing that machine for one. Um, okay, so, so looking forward, so first of all, we'll takeaways. So what we tried to show here, and we've been showing this a lot in the past few months, is, is that VP is real. So again, it's touching a lot of components, um, but it's consolidating. It's been around, you know, working this give and take with Intel for two and a half years. Get many opinions on how to exactly to do it, but we're gradually getting our communities to agree. Thank you. Um, second point is that if we go back to the problem we started, started with, so the, the issue was how can we decouple the VM or container from the physical link? And that's exactly what VDP comes to do. Okay? It's, it's the decoupling issue. That is, you can just have an image with a, with a standard driver run it on any physical link that supports VDP. So for VMs, it means that now you can actually migrate VMs between different machines, okay, with different connects. For containers, it just means that you can spin up containers on any machine that you want, assuming that the NIC supports VDP. Um, and it actually solves a, a real problem, which is the issue of certification. So certification for containers and VMs is, is becoming a more and more challenge, especially for telcos, as they go into mass productions, because them trying to fit the image of every container VM with the permutations of a specific driver and framework, a specific NIC, is, is almost impossible to manage and, and test because you have so many combinations of different, you know, the same application with different images, so it means different testing. If you're able to have a single image for the containers and VM with a simple vertical driver, you're, you're solving that problem. And it also opens the door to a bunch of other hub hardware floating capability because once you have a standard interface to go quickly into the NIC, so now you can start offloading additional things into to the NIC and make sense. Because there's no point of offloading all the stuff to the NIC if actually, you know, the interface going to the NIC is vendor specific. Uh, we expect all the major NIC vendors to be supporting VDP in the, in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, they're all involved, we're, we're working with them, supporting them, solving issues, announcing the spec. Um, some of the vendors actually have cards now. You know, they're going to be coming up with them with public, uh, public announcements. Um, we're also working on feature parity with SRV. So again, a key point here is to, to provide um, the users a simple migration path. It's not to come to them tomorrow and say, you have to change everything to VDP. It's a, you can gradually take containers of VM and, and migrate them to VDP, and you can still have the majority of your VM containers running in SRV. So it's, it's a gradual progress, and that's why we also want to have a feature parity with SRV. Um, we're also working to convince uh, cloud providers, Amnon's um, also here, so we have discussions with them. It's, it's challenging, but it's something that we definitely want to aim at. If we are able to convince cloud providers to also use VDPA, so that means that you can really start talking about a hybrid cloud solution and get the same image of the container or a VM to run over on-prem or public cloud, and it's, it's impossible today. Think of AWS ENA. Okay, ENA is SRV. So it means that if you're able to take a VM today or a container, attach an ENA interface, SRV, for AWS, it's not going to run anywhere else because you pushed their driver into your image. Okay? If you have something like VDP, you can take that image from AWS and just push it in on prem or G Cloud, anywhere else, assuming they support it. And, and that's a game changer for these specific use cases of. Um, VMs and containers, we want to accelerate. Another point to show you is, is the series of blogs. So one of the things that we've been working on is, um, 
is. Is something going to happen? Oh, it's. it's yeah, I forgot it was the PDF. Um, so, so again, I started with saying that, that it's complicated because there, there's so much history be, behind all this and different architectures for VOSnet to, to Vero Net and VOS user. Maxim talked about VOS user to, to Vero PMD and now VDPA. And we also mentioned briefly hardware floating and we compared it to SRV. So, so really, we, we, we really briefly touched all, this, all these topics. So what these series of blogs do is they really uh, take you step by step, and they're composed of, of three types of blogs. One is solution overview, so that's if you just want to see the big picture. So for each of the different architectures, architectures you get a solution overview. Then you have, you have a deep dive, okay? So that's really going down the rabbit hole, understanding the details. And you also have hands-on sessions with Ansible scripts. You can just go and try it out yourself. Last point is the uh, community, Vertio Networking. Um, with the mailing list, where do we see that? Oh, perfect. That's okay, we can just leave it. Um, mailing list, you're, you're welcome to, to register. It, it's an open public mailing list. We just use Red App because it's simple for us to maintain it. Um, discussions, for example, is Jason's discussion on the uh, uh, VDP kernel framework, the documents are there. Uh, discussions on AFRD.io, so that's more advanced socket-based solutions, also discussions there. You are welcome to join it. Anything else you want to add on this? I think that's pretty much it. Um, Q&A. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, what is the state of art uh, now, like, in terms of what are your features that make users implement? Should they implement all features, like, you know, multiple DSO? Uh, so, so the, the vendors uh, are not bound to, to support all the, the Vertex features that are existing. So this is preferable because uh, it will ease the migration path. Can you just repeat the question? Yeah, uh, does the uh, hardware vendors have to develop all the, uh, the Vertex features for a given uh, version of the Vertex specification? Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, like, what are your features implemented by the next, like, module buffers or the or DSO? Yeah, so it, it's, uh, it's um, to the hardware vendor to implement it or not. As, as long as he advertises it, he has to implement it. But, okay. The point is advertising, so it's feature negotiation. You don't have to implement all the features. Okay? Part of the work we're doing, for example, with, with Marvel, is so we're adding additional features into the uh, this negotiation because they need specific things to optimize their queues. So as long as the committee agrees that it's something that makes sense, we add it, and then the, the driver in the next, well, basically you, you can just have this negotiation and decide in runtime what do they what does it actually support and not support. So it's still the same driver in your image that can do the handshake to understand the real capabilities. Like, but the link also needs to implement that. Yeah, everything here is on the data plane. Yes. And second question is, uh, how does it compare with respect to the performance? So it, it's uh, again it's hardware dependent. So so we have uh, early samples on it. So we are not reaching nine right, right? Yeah. nine right. Yeah, <laughs> with uh, small packets, but uh, but it's still better than what we see with uh, uh, your user in software. Uh, oh. So but, uh, yeah, we're still not there performance wise, but I, I know specific vendors. I'm going to talk about 100 gig, you know, on a 100 gig line, 40 gig, right? 40 gig traffic. If you just use small packets, it, it can reach around uh, 30, like 60 million or so with the with the NICs that we know that are coming. But later on, you already know about uh, NICs doing it ASIC based and then WASP. Like, there's no real limitation, there's just the performance of the ASIC. So, implementation was just a point out. So, so, part of the vendors we're working with are planning to implement it based on, on NPR, FPJ or something. So, that's going to get some performance. But some are going to ASIC, so ASIC it will hit the SR. And it's going to be the same capacity, the same latency, okay, which actually in many use cases is more important. Sure. Since, uh, from what I understood, you moved some of the components from what you used to be in the guests into the host kernel, uh, does that mean you could uh, protect memory correctly without having to lock the guest memory? So we are moving. Yeah, uh, so I'm not sure to understand the question. Okay. <laughs> what, 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 so we haven't moved so, a component so from the guest so to the. It used to be the case that because uh, you have to share some memory, 
Yeah. Uh, if you use a space process and another one, yeah. you have to lock the memory in the queue in memory. Yeah, yeah. So, but in the case of DPDK, that's still true because we are using the same interface and we are. Uh, yes, but, but now you have this bus and everything is done on this bus. Is it so, possible to. So, to Amnon, so Amnon said yes, and I'll be, be very short about that one. The answer is that the socket based interface we're looking at will not require you to lock a page memory. Okay? You, you won't need to lock pages, but it's more complicated. It's based on the passive IDs that we're, we're able to pass. And, and that's something you know, I prefer Jason to, to really lead a proper discussion because there's a lot of details behind it. So in the long term, we expect to have another benefit. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So can you repeat your question? So what I your spec is extended and it's not something it's added to. You have to go through the community, put your proposal there, and if it makes sense, it will say goes in. That's a general case. Yeah, but from that, that case, you should be able to get the link from that, you should be able to get the link. Because you need, yeah, well, it depends if it's a control plane data plane. Yeah. Like, if it's in the data plane, yeah, but if it's a control plane, so maybe you could just take that in the mediation layer, so nothing has to change on the link. Any other questions? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you.